As an historian, I, a lot of my work, as I look back, it wasn't intended to be that way from the start, but has been about uh, creating taxonomies or typologies. And uh, that's sort of what I'm doing here uh, today as well. I do have a PowerPoint to share just because experience over the last several months shows that on Zoom, the sound can break up, but even if the sound breaks up, then you'll have the, the slide in front of you and uh, uh, you'll have some idea of, therefore of what I'm saying. So I am about, I will share my screen now. <clears throat> And the downside to sharing on screen on Zoom is one can't actually see it. Can you see my screen? All right, jolly good. So secularity, irreligiosity, and post-modernity are separate challenges to Adventist Christianity. And I think one of the problems is that we often talk about them um, as though they are one phenomenon. And part of you know, the, the real thrust of what I'm going to be saying today is that they're not, and we need to distinguish between them uh, more carefully. Uh, so an academic would say this, but you're all of Andrews, so that's okay, I'm with a sympathetic audience. How we conceptualize a problem matters. Secular risk, secularism, secularity are widely used uh, of post-Christian Western society and post-Christian attitudes. But actually, these have a range of meanings, they've just become catch-all terms that actually describe a spectrum of views and a wide range of socio-religious and socio-cultural phenomenon. Using phenomena, just using one term masks important differences, qualitative differences, and we'll talk about that, but also distinct historical origins. And I won't have time to go into that today. Of course, you know, this subject could be dealt with in a, at a much greater length, so uh, I am going to fly through things pretty briskly, apologies for that. What does secular mean? Uh, well, its original usage in the Middle Ages actually was for the church. Secular referred to a clergyman who was not bound by religious rules. So somebody who wasn't in a monastery or somebody who wasn't member of an order like friars who were like monks but not confined to a monastery and also somebody who wasn't the member of a chapter of a cathedral or of a collegiate establishment. Um, so it could either be an adjective, a secular religious person, or it could be a noun. So if I was to say such and such was a secular, it meant he was a priest who fit those categories. So this you know, shows how language changes that originally secular had this actual application to a religious setting. Now, in the early modern period um, and beyond, as astronomy and economics grew up as separate disciplines, the term came to be used to describe changes that are slow and over very long time periods. And actually, they're still used in economics and secular today. What one would speak of secular trends. I can remember doing that when I was teaching at Newbold and students about economic history and students being very puzzled because they thought I was going to be talking about religion uh, as opposed to uh, demographic and economic change. But of course, uh, these are not the usages we're most familiar with. The medieval eccles ecclesiastical usage to define somebody who's not engaged uh, under religious rules gradually expanded and then it became predominant. But here's the thing, there is still no simple definition. I expect you've gone into this in previous weeks. Secular is now, I think, generally taken to mean not religious. And in that sense, it's a value neutral term. It isn't describing something positive, it's describing something that is not something else. And that distinction between sort of a positive and a negative um, or a neutral will be important, we'll come back to it. But that meaning of not religious has of course given rise to other terms. Now in everything I'm about to say, to be fair, um, the, the meanings could be contested, or one could find other meanings as well. Uh, but I think these are ones that you will find fairly familiar. So what does secularism mean? Having said secular, what does secularism mean? It can be also somewhat value neutral, an affirmation uh, or belief in the principle that the state should be separate from religion. So secularism, in effect, one meaning of it is that it is 
the seeking of a level playing field in society in which religion uh, is not privileged or indeed any one religion or any denomination is not privileged over anything else, not privileged legally, economically, culturally, and so forth. Now, just a reminder, you may think, well, you know, this isn't much of an issue. It is a live issue. Formally, it's a live issue in almost all European nations, almost all of which have state churches or some kind of treaty between the state and the church that gives it a privileged status. And the truth is, as I think you're probably all aware, and as Nick Miller uh, would be able to tell you at greater length, informally, it's also still a live issue in, in the United States, despite what the Constitution and other things may say. So this isn't actually an unimportant meaning, but of course it's not the only one. Because secularism can also mean active belief in the inferiority of religious beliefs. And this leads to usages that are more or less synonymous with anti-clericalism, atheism, and similar terms. So in other words, in this meaning, it's not a rejection of the privileging of religion. It's not a seeking to deny something and achieve a neutral state. No, instead, it is a positive argument to privilege irreligion, even atheism. And in this form, secularism comes to resemble the belief systems it repudiates, which is highly ironic. Um, for example, it's taken as a matter of faith that the world around us and human life can only be understood in material terms and indeed um, People like Dawkins and Dennett and uh, Sam Harris and others in private, apparently, will actually admit that they don't even believe in free will. We're all just a collection of neutrons and so forth whizzing around the universe and that free will is, is, is therefore is an illusion. So highly material terms. Secularism has a set of beliefs which one must accept or be cast out or denied membership. And if one changes, then one becomes an apostate or a heretic. And secularism can be organized like a church, for example, the secular humanists, the humanist society, secular society, and others. These are acquiring the trappings of a church rather than just a, uh, uh, a belief or, or a set of ideas. So we talk, I led there to secularist humanists. What does secularist mean? Obviously, it can mean simply an inherent of secularism. But I think it means more than that. And I think widely secularist would be understood to mean someone who doesn't just believe that religion and the state should be separate, but has views towards religion that are antagonistic, is openly an agnostic, probably an atheist, and therefore seeks rather more than a level playing field. A secularist is, in fact, aggressive. What does secularity mean? I think a reasonable definition would be a state of affairs in which secularism prevails and in which secularists have achieved their goals. This would be, and secularity, by the way, would be a more or less literal translation of the French term laicite. Some of you may be familiar with it's a foundational, in fact, a constitutional principle of modern France. Americans look at it sometimes and view it rather simplistically as simply being about the principle of the separation of church and state, but because it arises from France's particular history with the Catholic Church, it in fact represents a profound skepticism on the part of the state um, to religion and really tries to foster skepticism by anyone not religious to religion. Indeed, it could almost be described as a hostility of the state to religion. So that it's very much not like the American principle of separation of church and state, where you have uh, freedom of exercise. Um, now, it is laicite, which is the excuse for banning the hijab, the burkini, etc., and so forth. Uh, and this is the entanglement one gets into uh, when secularism becomes an ideology verging on a religion, that you have something that arises from the values of the Enlightenment, laicite, adopting highly repressive laws, banning people what they do with their own headwear, for example. What does secularization mean? Well, it's a very loaded question. The simplest definitions would be societal trend towards 
maybe the complete separation of church and state, maybe the removal of religion from the public sphere, maybe the achievement of secularity. But all of these are positive movements towards change. Again, it's not just negating a current state of affairs. It's not just saying, no, we don't want religion to be uh, privileged over anything else. And just and it's, and it's not therefore just a negation. Instead, it's a positive seeking of a goal and, a, and of change. Now, secularization, as already suggested, verges onto a belief system, and secularists are like religious people, though they hate to hear this. I have engaged in sort of some kinds of discussions, and now I can guarantee you there is nothing an overt secularist hates more than to be told that secularism is really just another belief system like religion. Uh, you can almost see the vein pulsing in their forehead, and you're expecting them to have an apoplexy at any moment. But the truth is, they are true believers. They have ideology. They have a set of beliefs. There can be no other term for it. It's a set of beliefs, and they hold them zealously. They have a program for action that goes beyond the privacy of their own homes, though they desperately want to see religion confined to the privacy of people's homes and nowhere else. So they are true believers. They're zealots, in fact. And this is why you can have the apparent uh, contradiction in terms of evangelistic atheists, except, of course, you know, evangelistic is a, an odd term because they definitely don't have good news. Uh, the most famous are people like Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett. But there are you know, Chris, the late Christopher Hitchens uh, was one, though, interestingly, Christopher Hitchens' brother, Peter Hitchens, is an extremely conservative Anglican. So you know, it, 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 it's interesting how these things turn out. Okay, having gone over this, what's my point? The language of secularization and all those other terms is misleading about the real trends in Western society and culture. Because in most Western countries, I don't think there is a marked trend towards secularization in the or secularity in the ways that I've defined it. And you're all at Andrew, so you're academics, and you all understand that how one defines things is absolutely the key. And having defined it in this way, I can then play games with it as academics do. But nevertheless, I think what I've sketched out is, pro is, is probably familiar to you. And secularization, secularity in those terms is not the direction in which Western society is going, I believe. Um, I found very helpful an article in Sociology of Religion from 2012, and you see the, the reference there in case you're interested which argued, well, indeed, set out what I think is plainly true. The term secularization is a contested concept. And in fact, Western people have an enduring affinity for spiritual things. So if one in term, if secularization means the kind of things that we've been talking about, then actually we're not seeing it. Because there is this enduring affinity for spiritual things, though not for organized religion. Thus the, you know, almost uh, famous uh, saying, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Um, that's really vague and shouldn't be in some ways encouraging to Christians. But in other ways, it, it's striking because it is completely at odds with certain and significant definitions of secularism. And so the authors, Kaufman, Goujon, and Skerbeck, argue that we should use the less loaded term religious decline. Or what I have characterized here as irreligion irreligiosity, which, as they say, is also more empirically measurable. After all, um, as God tells Samuel, um, men have to look at the outside, only the Lord knows the heart. So we can't, uh, we can't measure belief in a way. What we can measure is practice, and religious decline is empirically measurable, and the data is, are very, very compelling. Um, there's been a number of articles now over the last 10 years or so that analyze very large data sets and they find universally the same trends. Obviously, different nuances in different articles and scholars and in, about different countries, but overall, the evidence is clear. Generational decline, both in participation in Christian religion and in belief in God and Christ and revealed Christian religion. It's massive across Europe, but it's increasingly there in Australia and North America. There is minimal trend towards atheism. Surveys everywhere show, you know, 
atheism is only very slowly ticking up. After all, who wants to believe that we're just a collection of neutrons meaninglessly floating around the universe? It's not exactly, um, as I say, it's not good news. Um, what there is, is a definite trend towards replacement of the Christian worldview. So just to, I mean, I could give a whole presentation just on all these data. Um, and you know, actually my job uh, legally requires me as director of archive statistics and research to give some statistics in every presentation. So here are the statistics. 70% of Europeans born in the 1970s are after believe that absolute truth does not exist that all truth is relative and personal. And in five European countries now, less than one in five of the population self-report any religious belief. And one could go on. So it's irreligiosity that there is a trend towards. But also I think here we need to come back to postmodernism. Um, now, it's interesting, for about 10 years, from around 2000, two or three through to 2012, no, 2013, uh, both as a, a teacher at Newbold and then at Pacific Union College and then in my job at the GC, I got asked to talk about postmodernism and not a lot. And it hasn't happened. I've been asked to talk about it since 2013. And I was recently at an um, Adventist college and talked with a, a, a colleague I knew well. I talked about postmodernism and he was like, ah, that's so passe. Pomo is so passe. He didn't say that, but that's what one could say. Um, well, the truth is, and I said this to him, that's true in academia and especially in English literature, which was his discipline. Today, English literature, where it, much of it began, is post, postmodern. They haven't found a new word yet. Um, and presumably in 10 years, there'll be post, post, postmodern and so on and so forth until somebody finds a better term. But here's the thing, postmodernist philosophy intellectually and in the academy is indeed passe. But I see an important distinction, postmodernist philosophy and the postmodern condition of post-industrial and especially post-Christian societies. Now, the philosophy, um, sorry, the condition actually predates the philosophy. And indeed, I think postmodernist philosophy gained popularity partly because it was an expression of the underlying condition of postmodernity. But I also think postmodernity was molded by postmodernist philosophy. So it's, and I think that's important to know. And therefore, what one finds is that amongst people who've never heard of Foucault and Derrida and Bourdieu and various other people, you can find a kind of half-baked, bastardized version of their beliefs uh, being regurgitated by people who've never heard of them and probably don't completely understand it. But the point is their views, while passe in the academy, are widespread and I think prevailing in Western society. You're welcome to disagree with that, but I think anyone would agree that Postmodernity is an issue. And let me just sketch out some areas that I think matter for our discussion. Uh, Foucault, and a couple of you may even recall, I did speak on this subject at Andrews University in 2012, um, and I refer a, a whole conference on mission to postmoderns, and so I can refer you to my chapter in that book um, for, for more. Um, but I just want to focus now not on Foucault, who I think actually is quite important, but on Jacques Derrida and Roland Barthes. Now, of course, if you were to uh, go out from this summer school discussion group, uh, go to the seminary and say to somebody, yes, I had somebody talk about Bart, um, they would think a rather different Bart. Um, his name would be Karl and he wouldn't have the ES at the end. So just to be clear, I'm not talking about the German theologian, I'm talking about the French post-structuralist. Uh, Derrida and Bart, both post-structuralist postmodernists and post-structuralism is a particular, arguably, subset of postmodernism. But what they had to say, I think, is particularly relevant for Adventists seeking to communicate our faith. So I'm boiling down a lot here, obviously. One of the key postmodernist claims, that's the claims of postmodernist philosophy, language is an unstable, shifting chain of signifiers. We think, and the whole thrust of the Enlightenment up to the 1950s or so, um, was that language has fixed meanings. 
No, it's an unstable shifting chain of signifiers. What does that mean? Truth claims cannot be stabilized by reference to reality or indeed to divine inspiration because truth claims can only be made by and through an imperfect means, language. And that means truth claims are themselves bound to be imperfect, inaccurate, and thus not wholly true. And the argument would be what is not wholly true is untrue. So truth claims are inherently untrue. Now Derrida, uh, who's known best as the creator of deconstructionist literary theory, you know, most famously argues that no text has a single fixed meaning. Every text contains within it the seeds of its own dissolution. What does that mean? Again, first, language cannot adequately express thought, and thus it cannot express an author's original intent. Second, a reader's understanding of the text is culturally conditioned, and therefore it is contingent. So this is, Derrida argues many things, and at times deliberately argues against things he's previously argued, because the whole thing for him is an amusing game. Um, Mul but this is crucial. Multiple interpretations result from the play of language. And that's why he can engage in playing, as it were, with his own intellectual ideas, because every, all, all intellectual discussion and debate is just effectively the interplay and game play in any case. So why not be have fun with it? Why not be playful with it? Barth was a little more serious, but to be fair, Derrida was extremely erudite and serious in many ways. But Barth takes a different tack. Famously, in 1968, he declares the death of the author, which is widely misunderstood. He doesn't mean that authors are unimportant or that there is no authorial um, impact on the text. What he's saying is the author can no longer be considered the transcendent source of meaning of a text or the authority for how it must be interpreted. Think of what a whole generation of conservative jurists on the U.S. Supreme Court, you know, they collapse and have a stroke and die on, on that thought. Um, so clearly they reject it. But uh, think of the implications for Christianity. And what it means is many multiple interpretations are possible. There is no one version of the text. There are multiple texts and multiple textualities. And of course, one of the curses of postmodernism in academia is that if you want to seem clever or trendy, you just turn everything from a singular into a plural. So there are multiple textualities. I would tell you, indeed, I have told you that there are multiple secularities, multiple secularisms, and so on and so forth. Um, ultimately, it becomes rather frustrating for a somewhat conservative academic, much as myself, to endlessly find titles that you have turned a singular into a plural, not always to any uh, great point, but you know, it comes from this. There is no one interpretation. Well, I think you can see the obvious implications for Christians and indeed for other religions whose religions are founded on sacred texts. So what we get instead of universal truth is a multitude of perspectives or narratives, stories that are told, stories that are told to achieve power over other people. Powerful belief systems Religion, yes, but not just religion. Science, political ideologies delegitimize some narratives, but they privilege other narratives. Those narratives might be woven together, but the result is not truth. It is a meta-narrative. Indeed, one of the most famous definitions of postmodernism is that of the uh, French scholar Jean-François Lyotard, who famously defined it as L'incredulité envers les métacrisies, incredulity towards meta-narratives. And to this, he made claims to about the end of meta-narratives, la fin de métacrisie. What he meant is the end, well, his skepticism towards and the end of overarching interpretations that made hegemonic claims. But the incredulity was towards all of them, even Marxism and almost all postmodernist philosophers were Marxists. 
So the incredulity is towards all meta meta-narratives. But Leotard argues for, and I think you can see it in other postmodernists, and you see it then articulated through multiple stages into the cultural zeitgeist. Um, again, people who've never heard of Jean-François Lyotard uh, and think that a Lyotard is something rather different, um, but they nevertheless have this idea. Uh, skepticism about big stories and particular skepticism about claims to progress, claims about the autonomy of reason, and claims that the autonomy of reason gave rise to emancipation. And the whole thrust of other postmodernists is to show that the things which the Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment thought had given rise to human freedom were actually just more tools for the powerful to oppress the weak. And I would therefore suggest that all of these can be just as well described as traits of post-modernity rather than merely of postmodernism, because they have made their way into the wider culture. And these, I think, I would see these as key characteristics of post-modernity, the post-modern condition. So how does it work out in practice, in popular culture? So for example, I'm going to show my age here, a movie that I liked when I was a teenager, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Though my daughter, who's 27, likes it too, so, uh, but, but then I inflicted it on her. So here, for example, you see Ferris Bueller. He knows he's a character. Here he is actually breaking the third walls, as they say, addressing the audience and telling us how to achieve certain things. He knows he's a character, but there's also playfulness with it. Pop art, which is not no longer just one picture that conveys a truth. It's a melange of images. Andy Warhol, most famously, his advertisement for Campbell's Soup, but you know, it, it's, it's everywhere. There are multiplicity. Even in, this is one of my favorite examples, and I get this from reading uh, the wonderful African-American philosopher Michael Eric Dyson, as well as some other things, hip-hop. Um, the DJ in hip-hop is actually known as the turntablist, and this is known as turntablism, which I think is a wonderful uh, expression. In the DJ's hands, there can be no such thing as a finished article, only tools to be used in constructing a groove. A previously recorded song, what we might think of as an established narrative, a fact, as it were, is broken down. It is, in fact, deconstructed, and then it's used to create an alternative new narrative and can be multiple new narratives. The author of the song is dead, as Bach might have put it. And, of course, what's striking, too, is that this is in the hands of, by definition, a hugely disempowered and impoverished group, and it is their way of achieving some agency. Well, one could go on this just to give you some examples of how I see these, you know, these intellectual ideas at work in the wider culture. But here's another, the rise of invented religions. In the most recent British census, a large group of people urged um, uh, British people, there was, there was a large group of intellectuals, some of them secularist humanists, others, I'm not sure what they were, who urged British people to indicate their religion as being Jediism, because the British census asks you to identify your religion. So the, you know, this is clearly a postmodern playfulness. It's like, well, you know, if we have to list a religion, screw that, we'll, we'll list Jediism. But the interesting thing is, this then actually gave rise to an organized movement of people who say, well, no, it's, that's not just a neat joke. I'll live my life according to the principles set out by George Lucas and now uh, Disney. Um, likewise, you have matrixism, obviously based on the three uh, matrix films. You have the church of all worlds and discordianism. Discordianism, as you can guess from the name, is indeed based on the very idea of multiplicity of beliefs. Now, none of these have a belief in a transcendent uh, deity. Uh, they have a kind of belief in transcendence, but not in any kind of supernatural power or deity. And here's my personal favorite, the church of the flying spaghetti monster, which quite wonderfully is known as Pastafarianism. So it claims to believe in a god. Um, the god is the flying spaghetti monster. So, you know, th the point is, if you don't believe in anything, um, you can claim to believe in whatever you like. Though, as I say, the interesting thing is, one might draw an uh, analogy, I think, with 
Bart's argument about how the signifier becomes the signified is that Jediism and Matrixism starting as a joke then actually become a thing. Uh, at any rate, those are obviously rather, we can, we can laugh at them, but there are other religions in which adherents do not believe. And if narrative has taken the place of belief, then the fact that you don't actually believe in the reality of the stories that are told doesn't matter. So one could look, for example, at the Sea of Faith movement in Anglicanism. It values the Church of England for the history and beauty of its liturgy. Sea of Faith Anglicans don't believe in God. At least they don't deny that God exists, but they don't actually believe in him. I remember once seeing an interview actually on the BBC with a, there was a, a, a vicar in Cambridgeshire who was going to be ejected from his uh, his post because he no longer believed in God, which you might think is a reasonable uh, basis for <laughs> firing somebody as a pastor. And they had an interview with his parishioners, one of whom said very robustly, uh, well, he mightn't believe in God, but he's a bloody good vicar. Um, obviously, believe in God no longer matters. But it's, you know, it says, the Church of England it has beauty and history and its liturgy, and this is a positive good in itself. Liberal Judaism is a similar example valuing Hebrew traditions, not actually believing in a God and practicing them partly out of a sense of connection with history. Anyway, to move towards a conclusion, thank you for listening to me so patiently, or at least I can only see half a dozen of you on Zoom when I'm doing this, so I'd like to think that you're listening patiently. I'm drawing it on a very small sample. Postmodernity is open to the irrational and to the mystic and mystical. It so, may therefore be open to religious approaches couched in those terms, but probably not in highly rational terms. Overt secularism is founded on the rational. Secularists would sneer at pastafarianism just as much as Seventh-day Adventists would. And it's interesting that Seventh-day Adventists are on the whole very skeptical of post-modernity, and I think rightly, to a great degree, and yet Enlightenment rationalism hasn't been so good for Christianity. It's ironic, in fact, that Adventism is very um, anchored in that kind of Enlightenment rationality. All our uh, apocalyptic interpretation, for example, um, is highly, you know, it's based on this very scientific approach to a series of numbers, and you can boil everything down and you can have the facts. So in some respects, we would actually uh, have more in common with the overt secularists. But this is one reason why these conceptualizations matter. If we simply lump together all the different kind of beliefs that exist in the post-Christian West into one category of secularism, that assumes that rejection of skepticism of organized Christianity, um, sorry, that their rejection of it's a bad statement there. I didn't edit it. The rejection of organized Christianity is the most important factor. And it's not. Secularists, I think, are still a relatively small minority. And the trend isn't towards secularism. It's towards irreligion or irreligiosity. Now, if we assume that rejecting organized Christianity is the most important factor, then we can put all these different phenomena together. And that may be actually understandable. It may actually make sense from a missiological point of view in just as sort of seeing it as a whole. But in another way, it doesn't make sense missiologically because it impedes us in mission, because it masks the essential differences between them. It also masks important continuities and discontinuities in belief in historical terms. So we need to understand what we're dealing with and also who we're dealing with. And we need to approach things differently, depending on uh, whether the people that we're trying to communicate with are indeed secularists, or they are simply irreligious, suffering, as it were, from the postmodern condition. And also, in trying to encounter some of the arguments that are solvent of a Christian worldview, encountering those arguments, we have to do it differently for the secularists 
and advocates of secularity than we do with the postmodernists and the pastafarians. So here are the questions to discuss. What might postmodern people see as Adventism's meta-narratives? Or it could be meta-narrative, but you know, we're being postmodern today, so let's have a plural. Uh, I think the obvious, you know, I can think of obvious answers to this, um, one obvious answer, but maybe there's more that may, what are Adventism's meta-narratives and how might those meta-narratives be recast to overcome the skepticism about meta-narratives that is characteristic of post-modernity? And the second question, what differences in approach might be required in witnessing to religious or post-modernist people on the one hand and overtly secularist people on the other?